What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. I am your host, Gavin J. Gallagher, and on this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the property or real estate investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset, behavior, to take control of your thoughts, emotions, and most importantly, your ego. So here we are on episode 32. In last week's episode, I was speaking about the building of a strong mindset and the uh, cognitive biases that exist. And um, you might wonder why that is so important. And really, I consider it to be kind of the basic foundation for your career or your investment portfolio. And so I thought I would just um, expand on that a little bit today and then go into some of the basics that um, that you can kind of add on to your the foundation that you're basically building if you're starting out in this business. And um, so whatever you build basically over time is subject to the quality of those foundations. And um, I know we normally get into a little bit of an update, but I'm just getting straight into this today because I think it's kind of a fundamental, important sort of rule. If you're going to get into this business, you got to start with a number of questions and um, I'm going to get into them in a little bit. But talking about the foundations, I just I was actually reading something and it kind of it, it thought it would be a good metaphor for the building of foundations. If you think about the leaning tower of Pisa and um, this is a bell tower that was designed back in the 1100s, the 11, I think it was 1173 when it began. And it's, um, you know, it's a bell tower, part of a cathedral. It's actually very, very tall building for its age. It's actually, if you were to compare it with the normal sort of building of um, of this time, it's actually about 18 stories tall. Uh, but when you look at it, it looks like it's only seven stories tall because the, the floors are actually double height floors. And... Um, Anyway, they started it in 1173 and believe it or not, it actually took 200 years to complete this tower. And um, obviously they took, you know, it took a long time to build things back in those days, but that wasn't the reason why. Um, Within the first couple of years of starting construction on it, it already began to start sinking. It was not, it didn't start sinking after they built it. It actually, by the time they got to the second floor, this thing was already starting to sink on one side. And so the, um, to give you an idea, the foundations, they were three meters deep, which is about 10 feet, but it was on unstable subsoil. It wasn't on rock or bedrock as we would call it. And when you're building a tower that's going to be 18 stories high, or let's say 55 meters high, or about, let's say 180, 190 feet, on three meters of foundations, you can see that it's very top heavy. And so by the time they got to the second floor, work had to be stopped because the building was starting to sink in one side and nothing happened for, believe it or not, 90 years. And in 1264, 90 years after it had begun, they started work again. And um, the, now the fact that it actually sat for 90 years with nothing happening to it, was a very good thing because it actually stabilized the ground and things like that. And it meant that they, um, the building would have certainly collapsed had they built the entire thing at the time and, it's, and it kept on leaning over. But because of that gap of 90 years, the ground kind of stabilized under. And when they started rebuilding, what is quite interesting is that they decided that rather than correct it and, and get the kind of... Um, and try to kind of get the ground straight at the bottom. They decided to just start building the third floor at a different angle so that it was pointing to the vertical. So the bottom two floors were leaning over and they thought, let's just put this third floor on in a kind of vertical manner and then the thing will kind of correct itself. But of course it kept on further leaning over. And every time it leaned a little bit further, they added another bit of an angle so that it would continue to kind of look upright at the upper floors, but on the lower floors, it was kind of still bending over. And um, anyway, by the time 1319 came along, they had hit the seventh floor, which is basically the top of the tower, with the exception of the bell, the part where the bell goes. And uh, the bell chamber, as it's called, that was added a little bit later. And because it had been leaning uh, I mean, the, just the way this thing was done is if you actually have a look at the photograph of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, 
you will actually see that the bell tower at the top is at a weird kind of an angle. It looks like a tipped hat almost. And that's because they were trying to keep that vertical when the rest of the tower was leaning so far over to one side. And um, believe it or not, actually, my mother visited uh, Pisa on, I think it was like her honeymoon or something like that. And they um, they went and they visited the, the tower and they climbed up to the top. You were actually allowed up at the t- to the top back then. And she came out and she was absolutely petrified, had to get down on her hands and knees. She was so scared because the angle just made it feel like the building was about to topple over. And believe it or not, it's actually about it. It leans out about 12 feet or four meters. When you're when you're at the top, you're actually sitting 12 meters or 12 feet out above the um, the where the where the base is, uh, which is quite a lean and um, Back in the 1990s, anyway, they decided to close the tower um, because there was a worry that it would actually fully collapse. And they actually started adding tons and tons, like hundreds of tons of lead weights to one side of the tower. And by doing that, it kind of slowed the, 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 you know, the, um, the sinking on one side. And what it actually allowed them to do is they started to excavate um, the soil underneath and inject it with concrete and all sorts of stuff to try to kind of basically stabilize it at that angle. And they actually managed to get it to kind of lean back about a half a meter, which, believe it or not, they're actually able to tell you the different, the, you know, over the years, how far it's leaned. They're able to say that they brought it back to the same position it was in in 1838. So that gives you an idea of the level. It had basically leaned another half a meter in the space of a hundred years or thereabouts. And this thing has been around now for 700 years. So it's it's kind of amazing that it has survived this long. Um, but like, <laughs> what am I getting to here? Basically the, 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 it's the, the moral of the story, I guess I'm trying to say, is that the foundations, if they had just got the foundations right at the very, very outset, none of this would have happened. Of course, now it wouldn't be a famous tower if it hadn't. But the fact is, is that this thing has been kind of ready to collapse for the last 700 years. And um, and so, you know, you don't want to build your career or your portfolio or anything like that on a shaky kind of a subsoil. You want to build it on something pretty solid. And so the, the point that I'm getting at is getting the fundamentals right from the very outset. And I mean, the fundamentals, whether that's your career, whether that's your investment portfolio, whether that is your, say, your project or even relationships or whatever, you got to go through a series of questions. And it's very important that you ask, you know, these basic questions. Number one, the what, the why is number two, the when, the where, the who, the how and the how much. All of these questions basically put you in a better position to actually be able to go forward with whether you're building this with the right foundation or not. So let's start with the what, for example. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. And you need to do this assessment yourself. You need to sit down with a pen and paper and just kind of sort of thrash this stuff out yourself. For example, what kind of investor do you want to be? Do you want to be a passive investor or do you want to be an active investor? If you're a passive investor, if you basically, if you have a career uh, that's a busy time um, that you you know you spend an awful lot of time on the phone or you spend an awful lot of time concentrating on your work, then you probably do not want to be an active investor because an active investor is going to need time to go and get involved, roll up the sleeves, go to sites, go to do various things like that, um, you know, examine what the builder that you've employed is doing or whatever it might be. So you may wish to be a passive investor. And that is something that you need to know from the very outset, because if you go and start, you know, if you go out and start looking for opportunities without thinking this through, you're going to end up possibly buying something that is not suitable for the type of investor you want to be. You, the next thing is like, what sector do you want to operate within, for example? And I'm not talking about whether it's commercial or residential. I'm just saying, for example, do you want to be in the building game or do you want to be in the rental game? Or do you want to be in the refurbishment and sell game? Or do you want to be in just simply the flip game, as they say? Um, All of this stuff, you can ask the very same questions then about if you want to be in the build game, do you want to be in the resi build game? Or do you want to be in the commercial build game or the industrial build game? 
or do you want to be in the rental? Do you want to build a portfolio? Obviously, it makes sense to get into one area because you can specialize in that one area. And if you're a specialist in an area, you tend to know everything an awful lot quicker. You mean, you, you can act quicker because you know the fundamentals better. So it's it's an idea to kind of think this thing through. Think about what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. Do you have a good network uh, of investors? Do you have a good network of, say, um, s- uh, trades people around you? That could be useful if you want to get into the build game. Do a kind of an analysis of all of the things that you have going for you in terms of how much time do you have available? Who who are the people in your network that are valuable? Do an assessment on where it is that you live. Do you know anything particularly um, useful for this? Like, do you, do you know a number of people who trade in a certain sector? That would give you inside knowledge, perhaps. You need to do this kind of evaluation on yourself. Next question, why? Why do you want to do this? Um, the fundamentals are often quite good because are good to know because you might be going in the wrong direction. For example, do you are you just doing this because you want to be rich? Um, is it is money your primary motivation or are you doing this because it's the profession that you have or you've you know you've gone to school and therefore you have built you're, you're looking to build a career in this? Are you doing this because you love it? Is this a passion of yours? I know a lot of people who got into real estate investment and stuff like that primarily because it was a passion of theirs. It was absolutely nothing to do with chasing money, nothing to do with schooling or anything. They just love tinkering around with properties and stuff. And then also, um, why do you want to do it? You might find that you are a person who... um, has a fantastic network. You might know a lot of investors. You might know a lot of bankers. You might know a lot of professional people. Those are useful things to know um, at the outset. What is your purpose here? Why are you going for this? Because there can be quite a lot of work in doing this. And you can find that it's very stressful at times, that there is going to be ups and downs. And if you're going into it for a reason, that turns out to be kind of, well, for example, if you're just going after the money and you think that this is going to be easy money, you might find suddenly that you're stressed out and that this was not anywhere near as easy as you thought it was going to be. And you might want to get out because of that. Whereas if this is a passion, then, you know, a little bit of struggle is not going to turn you off. Next thing is when. When do you want to start? Or better question is when should you start? And obviously they say, there's an old saying that the best time to plant an oak tree is 20 years ago. The next best time to plant an oak tree is right now. Um, But let's wait for a second, just talk about the economy. Um, COVID now, is it a good time or is it a bad time? You've also got the fact that we're, we're, you know, whereabouts are we on the economic clock or the wheel? Um, I talked about this in one of my earlier podcasts. If the the economy, the construction and the property economy and all that works in a kind of circular manner, um, you know, there's oscillations, there's up and down and up and down. And people kind of think to themselves, oh, I'll get the timing right. But you need to know where on the wheel you are. So if you think about a clock face and midnight, the top of the clock is midnight. The bottom of the clock is 6 a.m., we'll say. Um, the, uh, the, the far right, um, is three o'clock and the far left is nine o'clock. And if you could just think about the cycle that we've been in. So we've been watching prices rise for the last number of years, which means that we went from six to nine or nine to 12. And all of a sudden COVID has come and now we're looking at Brexit as well. All of this stuff to me makes us makes me feel as if we have gone past the midnight point and that we were somewhere on the clock. We were somewhere between midnight and three. And if you're somewhere between midnight and three, it means that there's actually potential for this to continue going down for another while until you hit six. And if you are in, if you go into this knowing that, well, then you sort of say, okay, that being the case, there's not a great rush for me to go and buy right now because market prices are going to be falling and I'm just going to sit back. I'm going to continue saving up my money. I'm going to continue preparing myself. I'm going to continue analyzing the market, making sure I am, 
you know, aware of everything that's happening, aware of all the risks, aware of all the deals that are out there, building my network, getting to know investors before you need the money. That's always a great thing. If you can, if you can just establish relationships when you don't need them, it always makes them a little bit stronger. If you go into a relationship in a needy kind of a way where you desperately need this person's money to do a deal, that uh, comes across very quickly in any kind of uh, personal kind of presentation or something. It's just, you just come across as needy and that's, that puts people off straight away. And so the best thing is try to establish relationships before you need the money so that by the time it comes around to you having a conversation about a deal, about an opportunity, you're not telling somebody, oh, this is a great thing. You got to go and put the money in. You, the guy already knows you. You've talked about your philosophies, you, you know, your ideas. You've talked about this and that. You have an idea by now about what is the guy's risk reward kind of um ratio what does he consider to be acceptable risk and all of that kind of stuff you can factor in so you'll know because you know this guy or this girl you know this person who is an investor you know what kind of risk they're prepared to accept you know the area that they like to invest in you know all of this kind of stuff and those are great uh, relationships those are the great times to go and ask somebody with, to invest because you actually have packaged up to the deal basically for them knowing all of this stuff in advance trying to go and meet somebody and you're on the back foot every time they open their mouth that's a new piece of data you didn't know until just now and so you're kind of adjusting as you go and you end up starting to contradict yourself and stuff anyway at the moment I don't know. It's a difficult one. COVID, big risk. I've actually been speaking to some of my friends who um, um, one particular person has been trying to sell. Uh, she's been looking to sell her property and she has um, a house somewhere in the UK, uh, quite a bit of land. And I think she keeps horses and stuff. And she was thinking about selling it. And she asked me a couple of months ago, what did I think? And my view was, you know, sell it as fast as possible. The market is going to be falling. But she she had her gut instinct was that there's actually still a little bit more in the market. She got an offer and she thought, I think I can get more. And I was saying, well, you know, if you don't need the money, then hang on in there and try and get more. But if you have got debt and you need to get out quickly, um, then sell quickly. But if you if you if this is not a huge pressure for you, then take your time and, you know, look for the right buyer anyway. Lo and behold, she didn't have the pressure to sell so she could hang on in there and she just negotiated an additional 200 grand, which is a, which is a decent scalp. I think she got an offer of 750 before and now she's up to 950. So she's very pleased with herself. And um, I still think it's a very good idea that she's getting out. I just think that the market is in for a rough ride now. Um, Regardless of what happens with this last minute stuff between the UK and the EU, I think there's going to be a couple of difficult years coming ahead. Anyway, back to our questions. The next one is where again, another where, where do you want to invest? Do you want to invest locally or do you want to invest nationally or do you want to invest internationally? Now, my advice to you is to pretty much at the moment when you're if you're starting out for sure, st invest local. Do not. It, r the real estate game is very much a local business. You can actually become a millionaire without going more than, say, one mile from where you live. And uh, that's a that's a true story. You can actually do that. But because you know people around you very well, you know, agents, you know, the areas, you know, the history, you know, the circumstances, you know, the laws, all of that is familiar to you. And so it's more likely that you're going to know stuff than people from outside of that area. And you're going to have an inside track that a lot of other people don't have. Now, when you national investment, for example, if you live in the north of England and, you know, you're, you'd like to invest in London, that's an understandable thing. You know, li investing in the capital city is obviously, you know, it's attractive and it's kind of like stepping up to the big league. 
but it's something that I think you should ex aspire to without rushing into because you gotta gonna get your 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 feet wet and um and, and just kind of learn the ropes before you start trying to move to the national level. Now, international sounds very glamorous and enticing. And where it looks especially interesting is when the local markets begin to look expensive or, you know, it's, it's hard to find a deal and you're starting to get kind of bored. You got to give this very serious thought. I, I have made a lot of mistakes investing internationally. It's not as easy as it might seem. It always looks, you know, the grass is greener on the other side of the street is what they say. And that is the case with international investment. You think that it's, you know, oh, this looks like a fantastic deal. But of course, you're not comparing it with the base that you know. You're you're comparing it with an unknown base. So you got to do all of your homework. And if it took you a couple of years to learn your local market, why do you think that you can just arrive into an international market and, you know, in a couple of, in the space of a couple of weeks, learn all of the same information? What stood for you in your local market stands for the local guys in that international market. And if somebody is selling a property in an international location and foreigners are buying it, you got to ask yourself, why are the locals not buying locally? Is it because perhaps it's too expensive? Is it perhaps because they know something that you don't know? And the, you know, the idiots from, from far away are coming in and spending their money. And these guys are kind of laughing all the way to the bank. So you just got to think about that. Now, there are, of course, times to invest abroad, but you got to do your homework. You got to really know. I was speaking to somebody recently who invested into Brazil back, in, you know, years ago at this stage now. But he was investing in Brazil when the interest rates were up at around 22% or something like that. And it was just so obvious that interest rates were going to be, you know, brought down to match the rest of the world, which was much, much lower. And so um, it was just a, it was a matter of time before yields started to compress, as they say. Anyway, a lot of unknowns when you invest uh, internationally. So you got to make sure that you have a partner that you can trust. And I mean, trust with your life. If you go and get local partners when you're investing internationally, you need to know this person for longer than just, you know, you've arrived and the guy sounds like he's an interesting guy or he, <laughs> you'd like to invest in him. I can tell you that um, when I was living in Spain, I remember being introduced to this chap by a friend of mine and um, the guy was very impressive and he had all of these credentials and he was talking the big game and I remember sort of having a quiet word with my friend later on and I was we were having a pint and I just sort of said you know do you trust this guy and he goes yeah I'd, I'd trust him with my life and I was like wow you know you'd actually go that far you trust him with your life and he goes yeah yeah I would you know and I said that's a very strong statement like you're vouching for this guy completely are you sure you would do that? And he goes, yeah, yeah. And so I took him on his word and I started paying attention to this guy and we met several times. Now this was, I was actually trying to find an investor and he was offering to invest. So it sounded too good to be true. And usually when it is too good to be true, it turns out to be the case. Turned out this guy was a complete fraudster and scammer and very sophisticated one at that. And he had me producing all of these cash flow returns and all the like he had me doing so much work to basically earn the his investment. And he had me jumping through hoops and he had me doing all this stuff. And I can remember I spent two weeks working nonstop on this big, you know, economic projection for my project so that this guy would invest. And I think he he was talking about putting 80 million into the pro, into the project, which obviously huge sum of money and it would have made a massive, massive difference to the project. And I can remember sort of saying yes. And, and he wanted to know he was kind of stress testing me. He was pushing me back. He was kind of making it look as if this 80 million was going to be very, very hard for me to get my hands on. And so the more he pushed back, the more the harder I kept on coming for it because I wanted to, to, to kind of land this investment. And anyway, long story short, he said, he said, I said, OK, we're going to. Yeah, we will invest. We'll, we'll invest the 80 million in your project. So it was like, wow, slam dunk. This is, you know, a huge result for me. 
And uh, so I was about to start celebrating and he says, listen, you know, we are a, uh, you know, the organization I'm with is part of a bank in Switzerland and we, we're going to need to make you a client of this bank. And I was like, um, sure, yeah, no problem. Um, you know, I'll open an account right away. Just tell me, you know, what I have to fill in. And he goes, oh, well, you'll, you'll have to put money in the account. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. You're like, what, a thousand euro or something like that? And he goes, no, you're going to need to put two million in. And the moment those words came out of his mouth, I just knew this guy is a scammer. This guy is trying to screw me over. I remember saying to him, well, if I'm, if you're going to lend, if you're going to invest 80 million in my project, why don't you invest 78 million and just put two into my account? And there you go. It's sorted. And he's like, oh, well, no, you put the two million in and in about a month's time, the 80 million will flow. And I just remember thinking to myself, oh, you are you are kidding me. I have spent two weeks working through the night on on this project for this idiot. And now he's he, I've just figured out that he's a scammer. And I was really livid and I was sitting there. I, I felt like smacking the guy. But then I thought to myself, geez. The south of Spain, this guy, you know, who is he? Who's he connected with? I suddenly started to worry that maybe he's actually like a part of a criminal gang or something like that. And maybe I'm a little bit out of my depth and maybe I better just play along here. So in the end, I kind of dragged it out. and I, Nothing ever happened. But I can remember just thinking to myself, wow, this is this is a real eye opener. So anyway, um, in fact, I'll tell you a funny aside. That guy who was talking the big game and everything like that, I was obviously on his email list after. And about four years later, I got an email from him. And this is him sending it out to everyone in his network. And you're not going to believe, for a guy who was so convincing before, he sends out this email, says, guys, uh, I need I need somebody to help me. I was mugged today. And my wallet was stolen and my passport was stolen. And I need to get back to the UK to sort out a new passport. But my credit cards are gone. Everything's gone. Can somebody lend me, uh, you know, a thousand pounds or something like that? And I'll get it back to you. I just need to get back to the UK. And I can remember just thinking to myself, oh, my God, this guy like is just he's like he, he sent this out now to everybody. And so that's how shameless he is. But he was actually, had he not been so bloody greedy looking for two million, he could have possibly gotten, you know, a couple of thousand out of me. Because if he had said to open a bank account costs a thousand or five thousand or something, I probably would have done that because it sounded like, you know, reasonable. But when he said two million, I just knew, hold on a second, nobody needs you to open a two million bank account. Anyway. A little aside there, I'm drifting away from the point. The back to the questions. The next one is who? Who do you know? Now, your network is everything in this business. And some of the best deals that I've ever done have come through my network, whether it's an introduction to somebody or whether it's a bit of a off market tip, you know, a little bit of a, a nod and say, you know, that property's coming up for sale. You might want to get in ahead of the queue and things like that. Pals often are very, very useful way of figuring out something just before it happens or getting a little bit of inside track on maybe the next door neighbor is thinking of selling something or whatever. So your network is really everything. And if you know people, it can be a very, very suggestive, it'd be a good way to suggest as to what sector you're best likely to be in. For example, um, one of the wealthiest people that I've ever met is um is a big london real estate guy he's actually he's not from england originally but he was he told me that he started out in the um uh, in the fashion game and he actually used to sell clothing and he bought a he bought a small warehouse to store the clothing and he bought it uh, just as a, a simple place to store where his his clothing and when he sold the property a year or two later, he made such a huge profit on it. He suddenly started questioning, like, why am I in this clothing business like this is what I need to be in. And so um, it's just amazing how you can just find, you know, find your way into something just because you're in a sector and you have a slight bit of inside knowledge. Another who is who will you be working with? 
Um, what kind of partners do you think you can work with? What kind of investors do you have in your network? What kind of banks? Who do you know in the banks? What professionals do you know? Um, and a great thing to, first thing to ask yourself is actually not, um, not how, but who. If you, if the first question you're asking yourself is how to do something, you're asking the wrong question. The, the, the first question should be who is going to do something because there's always somebody out there who knows how to do it better than you. And a lot of the time when you are a kind of entrepreneurial type person, you're going to spend an awful lot of time thinking how to do this yourself because you're kind of a self-starter this i do this to myself all the time the first thing i do is think okay how am i going to do this because i'm a, you know i kind of tend to go at things myself and i feel like i can do it but the best thing is is who can do that for you and then another question is how so how will you do it how will you finance it how will you build it how will you lease it how will you market the property do you have any experience in any of those areas who do you know again who and um, like do you know people who have that knowledge how because how is 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 where it all boils down to and then another how how much how much capital do you have to invest how much time do you have to invest that goes back to the first question on whether you want to be a passive or an active investor how much risk are you prepared to accept? This is the risk reward thing that we um, we talk about. Some people have got a, a huge aversion to risk. Other people are much happier accepting a bit of risk. And obviously, if you want to make a lot of uh, money, you have to be prepared to accept some of the risks that go with that. Big big risks mean big rewards and and you know if you're not prepared to take a risk then you've got to kind of dial back your expectations in terms of the reward one of the most important things to know is exactly what you do not know what you don't know or what you don't have whether that's expertise or knowledge or whatever knowing that you don't have it is super important uh, because this is not a game where ignorance is bliss once you've identified something that you're lacking, then you can find ways to get answers or to, sol to solve that. And I got a great question from one of our listeners, David, uh, earlier in the week through the Facebook group. Incidentally, the Facebook group is called Behind the Facade Community. And if you haven't joined it, give some thought to, to joining us there because it's a good place to ask me questions and um, and get sort of direct replies. I've already answered this question for David, but he was asking about health and safety and he's embarking on a construction project. And I gave him a brief bit of advice through the Facebook Live, but really I was only, the, you know, telling him really the tip of the iceberg. The reality is, is that he asked a good question and he now knows like that this is an area that you cannot neglect, that you need to go and try and find people with expertise in that whole area because there's a whole area of compliance health and safety compliance there's liability if you as the landowner don't have all of this kind of stuff um, checked off and if you don't have professionals managing the risk you could end up losing everything and you're, you could even find that the insurance you have is not covering you because you didn't have these basic health and safety checks in place so it you know it might cost you a bit more to bring in these people but this is a serious business that we are in this is not a lifestyle as i've said before this is not a lifestyle this is a business and you don't win by taking shortcuts and trying to save a little bit here and there you're you know you're if you're going to remain ignorant on something then that is a big risk that is going to possibly take you down so just remember that ignorance is definitely not bliss in this game and then the the basics i mean at the end of the day i like to sit down every now and then and get out a journal and, and start working through these questions myself you know even me with all the years experience that i have it's actually uh, very important to sit down and just evaluate yourself every now and then you got to stay fresh and alert you got to first of all the, ch the market is changing all the time so you know just because you're experienced doesn't mean you you, you shouldn't sit down and reflect on where the market cycle is has the market changed like for example i used to make a lot of money in the whole retail sector where i'd buy and sell you know retail units 
that that's you know a sector that's just died a death in the last few years because of Amazon and online shopping and all that. Now I do have my I do have my kind of question in my head every now and then about with all of the prices that have fallen in the retail sector that is potentially an interesting area to to go and pick it up at good prices but who's going to rent it because a huge amount of businesses are going to be closed down after covid and stuff so it might be an interesting time to pick up cheap properties but you might be finding yourself sitting on them for a while um, anyway, if you go, if you're doing something over and over and over again to the point where it becomes easy, then you need to stop and have a think about what it is you're doing because it's very easy to get complacent and just sit back and think that this is easy street. And what happens is the world changes around you and you're not paying any attention to it. I've met guys that are that were incredibly successful and they took their eye off the ball because they were so successful. And along came a competitor and basically like ate all of their market share while they were busy kind of partying basically because they they owned this like fabulous business that was making lots and lots of money. They their much smaller competitor came along and just basically took over their entire market. And the guy was offered, you know, tens of millions for his business at one stage and ended up couldn't couldn't give the the business away because he had lost market share he had not invested in technology at the time that he should have he had basically just been asleep at the wheel and these guys came along and just took everything and um, I mean they didn't steal anything they just caught the guy asleep and that's it he he lost so that is something that you got to sit back every now and then take out the paper go through the what why um, you know let's just think about that again what are they again i'll just read back what i said it's what why when where who how and how much those are the questions ask yourself those reflect on it reflect on if there are any areas where you could improve are there any areas where you could innovate and um that's it look guys that's all i have for you this week it's i thought we're just going to go back to basics for a change i'm i've got some great guests coming on in the uh, in the next week i was going to be chatting with someone last week who sold his company for over 100 million a few years ago and um, i'm really looking forward to having that conversation but unfortunately the more successful these people are the more busy and difficult they can be to kind of get in front of a computer screen so he um, he asked if we could reschedule at the last minute so Got to push that one out a little bit further. In the coming week, I have some, I have two incredibly um, good industry leaders booked for a discussion. So the next week or two, you're going to have some really, really interesting conversations to listen to. One from Australia and the other from the USA. So I would suggest that uh, you guys tune in next week um, to learn some more. Now, uh, is there anything else apart from the outro? That's all for episode number 32 of Behind the Facade. Thank you so much for listening. Please find web links. Well, this week, there's not a whole lot to, to show you. What I would point you to once again is my the two books that I have released as a co-author in the last um, two weeks or so. And I'll put links in the show notes for both of them. If you found this episode useful at all, I, my number one ask, as always, is for you to leave me a review or even just a five star rating over on iTunes or whatever platform you listen in on. This is really helpful for getting the uh, noticed by the algorithm and it obviously moves us up the rankings, gets us more, um, more awareness and people start to listen. If you have any questions or topics that you would like me to cover in future episodes, please connect with me via my Facebook group Behind the Facade Community or you'll find me on social media using the handle Gavin J. Gallagher. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. That same uh, handle works for them all, Gavin J. Gallagher. And lastly, if you want to stay up to date with the various things that I'm doing and stuff that I'm thinking and writing about, you can sign up for my email list stroke newsletter over at www.gavinjgallagher.com forward slash go 
All right, guys, I will catch you next week. Until then, go make it happen. Mm-hmm.